time to suddenly this on the Radio. I'm Scott Teeters, and today is Friday. It's September the 6th, 2013. We're continuing our Friday night fun with the second hour by going to Hollywood. Well, actually, we're going to Texas to, to talk with Hollywood insider and veteran Michael Druxman about his fun, fun book, My 45 Years in Hollywood and How I Escaped Alive. <laughs> like automobiles and muscle cars, movies and Hollywood is a uniquely American creation. Of course, Thomas Edison patented the first motion picture machine called a kinetograph in the early 1890s. And like many inventions, such as graphics-based computers, the motion picture camera really didn't take off until the machine got into the hands of the creative types, you know, the artists. Of course, the artistic types took the motion picture to places that Edison never imagined, and Edison had quite a vivid imagination. Original movies were silent, then came sound, and then color, then television came along, then video, and today we watch movies and shows, musical performances, and sporting events on computers and handheld devices. It's all quite amazing, and along the way, an entire industry was created. Of course, Hollywood put the sparkle into the art form, but it can be a rough and tumble business. Michael Druxman has been a publicist, a screenwriter, director, filmmaker, and a playwright. He's rubbed shoulders with Hollywood royalty, probably a few con men and scoundrels in his time. And as the title of his memoir puts it, he escaped alive. Michael's with us for this hour to tell us about his fascinating life in the entertainment biz. Hi, Michael. Welcome to the program. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Well, Hollywood has um, never not been a tough town, so we're very glad that you're a survivor. So let's start at the beginning. Do you? And I was wondering, because I was going through your book this afternoon, and, and I was wondering if you would tell us, do you recall when it was that you first had the thought that you wanted to be part of showbiz? Yes, you had, I know exactly. I know exactly when that was. I was four okay. years old, <laughs> and uh, my mother, uh, you know, this was in the mid '40s, and my mother took me to see Pinocchio, and Pinocchio singing "Hi Diddly D" an actor's life for me, and that was <laughs> it. I was there, there was never, never anything else I wanted to do but be in show business. Mm -hmm. And and you had a uh, you know everybody has to have a big dream and a and a goal and uh, yours was uh, you're going to be the next Orson Welles right? Well, that's you know when I that, that's what I wanted to do, but sure. you know then the the reality uh, comes into the problem with Orson Welles is he, he made his uh, obviously twenty one twenty two something like that twenty three when he made Citizen Kane and after that it was all a, it was all a downhill slide. Right. Uh, I really didn't want that. Um, <laughs> but I came to Hollywood. I, I'm from Seattle originally. And I had a relative who I'd never met in, in, in the film business who was quite successful. He was like a second cousin. I'd heard stories about him. And, uh, I, you know, I figured, oh, God, I've, I've, got, I've got an end there when I go down there. Uh, his name was Fred Ziv. And basically, he created uh, syndicated dramatic television. He, Ziv Television produced shows like Highway Patrol, The Cisco Kid, Sea Hunt, shows of shows like that. So, but when I was in college, about three or four years before I I went to Hollywood, uh, you know, I was in college, and he sold his company and moved back home to Cincinnati. <laughs> so, so much I went that. down there with absolutely no contacts whatsoever. <laughs> I finally met Fred Ziv maybe 20-some-odd years later. I was in Cincinnati on a publicity um, uh, junket, and uh, I called him up. He said, well, what do you want? I said, I just want to meet you. And so we met for about five minutes. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. That much, huh? Yeah. Well, when I was reading through your, your book this afternoon, uh, you, you had some interesting experiences, sort of trial and error, learn on the job, uh, directing plays when you were in uh, Seattle. Uh, what was that like for you? Well, I went to the University of Washington, and I went in the drama department. And my freshman year, I did like seven plays back to back at the Penthouse Theater, which was actually the first permanent theater in the round in the United States. And, I, you know, I'm, I've always been the kind of person, I guess, that been there, done that. 
And after seven plays back to back, I got sort of bored with acting. It didn't. There was really no thrill in it for me anymore. And what I really wanted to do was direct. But at the University of Washington, um, you could you couldn't get into directing till your senior year. And here I'm going to be a sophomore. So. I, I stopped doing plays at the UW, and I went out into the Seattle's community theater and um, talked my way into directing. You know, it took a few months, but I talked my way into directing a play and and, um, and then another play. And I, uh, by my senior year, I had formed my own theatrical company. Hmm. And... Um, we, we we did plays like uh, you know Tennessee Williams suddenly last summer. We did the Miracle Worker, and, and shows of that elk, and um, and then I graduated and came down to Los Angeles. Before you came to L.A., I was uh, I, w- I got a kick out of a, a story that you told about uh, how you got hired on as an extra, uh, oh, yeah. playing in a movie with the. King of rock well, and roll, Elvis the pelvis, Elvis himself is. <laughs> well, you know, this, this, the Seattle's World Fair was in 1962. Right. And they made, uh, MGM came up there with Elvis Presley, and they made a film called It Happened at the World's Fair. Oh, it was and a good And <laughs> I was actually directing a, a play at, at that time, and, mm-hmm. and um, it was during the summer. So there was no school. I was directing a play, but, you know, I had a free day, and they were hiring extras. So I I figured, why not? So I went down there, and they hired me. And I didn't, you know, the the, the pay was $10 and a box lunch. And I didn't really care about the $10 and a box lunch. What I wanted is when the movie came out, I wanted to be able to see myself on the screen. Mm -hmm. And um, so... The assistant director kept sticking me way in the background, uh, you know, where I'm like a human ant. And I, the one thing I did know is that if I wanted to be able to see myself on the screen, I had to be close to Elvis. So, you know, t- it takes maybe 45, a half hour, 45 minutes to set up a shot. So the, the assistant director sits, sticks me way in the background. And while they're setting up the rest of the shot, I'm kind of working my way up you know, to where Elvis is. And, you know, at one point I'm standing right next to him and we're having a very friendly conversation. And uh, Colonel Parker, her man- his manager, is sitting off to one side. He evidently sees me talking to Elvis. He calls over the assistant director. The assistant director comes over to me and says, you're not supposed to talk to Elvis. And uh, evidently that was a mortal sin. And um, he, he looks at me and says, uh, don't I know you? And I said, I don't think so. He says, look, kid, I know what you're trying to do. Just be cooler about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm in the, you can spot me in the movie. In fact, there's a little, uh, there's a, a scene that has been, that seems to be broadcast. Whenever they, they clip this movie, they, they show this scene. It's a scene with Kurt Russell, who was then right. a little boy, mm-hmm. where Elvis comes up to him and says, hey, Kick me in the. Sh- I'll give you twenty five cents to kick me in the shins. And during that scene, I walk by him, and <laughs> there's a um, some sort of little movie on on YouTube. I think it's called Elvis in Seattle or something like that. And I'm in that. Mo- you know, you can see me if you. You know, I'm a, I look a lot younger than I do now. But but that was my first professional show business job. I think the scene goes something like, uh, well, Elvis has his eye on a on a pretty nurse, and he's trying to concoct a, a reason to go to the right. uh, infirmary. And uh, he, uh, he he says, hey, kid, I'll give you a quarter if you kick me in the shin. So he kicks him right. in the shin, and he goes hobbling into the nurse. And then he's he's making making up with the with the nurse, and he's walking around the fair. And a little, little kid comes up to him. He says, hey, hey, mister. I'll kick you in the shins again for another quarter. Right. <laughs> the girl goes, "You rat." How many times have you seen this movie? Oh, I've seen the. I saw the movie once. That was really enough. And but that, yeah, it but really that was. It's really clip, a pretty bad film. Yeah, it really, it really is. But that was a very funny story that I read in your book. 
Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> it, was, it was a real surprise, too, you know, because um, I'm just reading the book here, and all of a sudden I see Elvis Presley. How about that? The guy's yeah. everywhere, you know. I, uh, I was a fan, and, and uh, my, when my daughter was growing up, you know, she heard Elvis music in the house. And, you know, I used to tease her when we go out someplace, like we're at a mall, and if I saw a poster, I'd say, Nikki, look, there's Elvis. And she said, where, Daddy? I point to the, point to the post. And she said, Daddy, Elvis is everywhere. Elvis lives. Uh, Michael, we have some music playing in the background, so we're going to take a little bit of a break. or spending some time this evening with Michael Druxman. We're talking about his uh, fun book. It's called uh, How I, My Career in Hollywood and uh, My 45, my, my years, 45 in Hollywood. years in Hollywood and How and, I Escaped Alive. And how I Escaped Alive. The book's available on Amazon in print and in Kindle format, as well as a lot of Michael's other books and his celebrity-based plays. And we'll be back in just a few minutes. Okay, we are back, and if you're just joining us, Hollywood insider Michael Druxman is our guest for this hour. We're talking about his memoir, My 45 Years in Hollywood and How I Escaped Alive. I you love know that, that title. Elvis story we just told, I just, we just was talking about, it's a, it's a fun story, but you know, it's also a life lesson there. Because if you want something, you, you know, it's difficult to get, there are ways to skirt, you know, the castle walls mm -hmm. and tenacity. That's that's the key. Nothing you look, you look for a way to to skirt the castle walls, and you stick to it. It, mm -hmm. it took me ten years of trying to sell my first screenplay. Wow, you know. So, well, when you went to Hollywood, you you attended a seminar, uh, and the featured <laughs> guest was an actor who was really he was the hot guy of his time, uh, Mike uh, Jack Lemon. And, he, right. and uh, you, you learned an important piece of information there. Tell us this story, because this is, this is quite humorous. Well, uh, you know, the, everybody asked him the question. I got to know Lemon, you know, years later. But uh, uh, you asked him the question, um, and I didn't ask the question. Somebody else did. Uh, uh, what's your advice for somebody who wants to break in the movie business? And he said, don't. <laughs> and he said, but the only people who should try to break into the movie business are the young because the young are stupid that they do not can they cannot conceive of the possibility that they can fail and that is the kind of pigheadedness and that you have to have to crack into this business uh Going back to the word I used a couple minutes ago, tenacity. You have to stick to it, and you have to have your target and go for it. Mm -hmm. And there's always a way in. If you've got the talent, uh, or even if you don't have too much talent, if you, there is always a way in if you, if you look for it. Mm -hmm. how, how did you get to uh, know him uh, years later, Michael? Oh, I, you know, going to... Um, going to uh, uh, premieres and things like that and industry events, you know, we would, we would be at the, um, at the same event. And in fact, my, my, I have a, a second uh, memoir coming out in a couple of months called Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Hollywood. And I, uh, I write about, you know, a, you know, a chat we had, mm -hmm. uh, you know, years later. But you, you, you go to these things, you meet people. It's it's that's the key, really. You know, I I, I live in Austin, Texas, and uh, I, I you know I talk to groups all the time. And uh, the one thing I say, if you want to have a serious career in this business, you've got to move to Hollywood, Hollywood or New York, preferably Hollywood, uh, because that's where you can network. Mm -hmm. And uh, you 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 uh, go to places where people in the business uh, mingle, and uh, you know, they're just people. They're just yep. people, and uh, um, you know, I, I, I think where I, uh, you know, we got chatting was at the uh, one of my publicity clients was uh, Dan O'Hurley, uh, actor, character actor, and we were at the premiere of um, MacArthur with Gregory Peck, and Dan mm -hmm. played the FDR in that, and uh, you know, I got the chatting with Lemon there, and you know, so. Um, he he was one of those those actors that uh, you know, just as, as a fan and someone that used to read uh, you know Hollywood movie magazines. I don't ever remember hearing anything 
derogatory about him, you know, that he was difficult or cranky or, you know. No, he's a very nice man. He was an alco- self-admitted yeah. alcoholic. Right. In fact, fe- in, um, uh, there was, the, what's that show, the... Um, the Days of Wine the and Roses? studio show. He, he, he came, right, uh, came right out on that and admitted that he was an alcoholic, mm. but uh, wow. one of the nicest guys you ever want to meet and a fine actor. Well, maybe that's why he played the uh, that, that lead role in the Days of Wine and Roses so well. Uh probably that, could be. That was al- that was almost painful to watch. I know. Yeah, I know. I do not like movies about uh, alcoholism or drug addiction. They just mm-hmm. I try to avoid them. <laughs> yeah. It's not not real entertaining, is it? No, no. Well, I thought when you went to Hollywood, I thought you had a a, a very interesting strategy of how you were going to break into the business and uh, <laughs> with uh, with short films. A great idea, but uh, tell us about uh, tell us what your plan was back then. Well, I think I think the business has changed since then. Um, my plan was to uh, go to Hollywood, make a make a short film, and that would be my calling card. But at that time, there was really no market for short film, and uh, so we, we, you know, I made this film, and uh, uh, I, I even got John Carradine to narrate it. And um, but there was no market for it. Today, you've got YouTube, you've got a lot of other sure. places, but it was, that didn't exist back then. But the, you know, the, I uh, after being in the business for you know in town rather for a couple of years, I came up with this idea for a a budget publicity service. Uh, sort of the you know Walmart didn't exist then, but a Walmart <laughs> publicity service that virtually any actor could afford. And so I started running ads in the uh, Hollywood trade papers, and immediately I'm getting phone calls. And, uh, you know, the, my first few people I took on were not that well known, but within, I would say, 90 days, I started taking on some very important people. And because, you know, I could deliver and and some names who were with the more exp- larger, more expensive agencies, uh, and they were paying these high fees. They said, why should I pay these fees? This guy can do the same job for me. And uh, they came over to me. And I uh, had a, you know, I had a, was in that business for like 30 some odd years. Wow. You mentioned in your book that uh, you, you first were attracted to the idea of being a publicist because you heard that some of the publicists can get uh, $500 to $1,000 uh, a month. Uh, not bad for 19, what was it? It's 1964. Uh, uh, mid 60s. Mid-60s. Mm-hmm. But I'm saying, well, what do you do for that? What, I, and I, what, what do you do for that? And they say, well, you get their names in the trade. I said, I can do that, uh, you know, like that. That's very simple. All you need is a piece of news, and you, it gets in the trade papers. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, the trade papers don't exist anymore, the daily trade papers. They're both right. weeklies, and they're not really newspapers anymore. Yeah. Now it's all Twitter feeds and, uh, and yeah. uh, Facebook yeah, and they and they get and they get themselves into trouble on the, on Facebook all the time. Michael, we've got music in the background. We're going to take a little bit of a commercial break. We're talking to Michael Druxman this evening. He's telling us some of his uh, interesting uh, stories based on from his book, My Forty Five Years in Hollywood and How I Escaped Alive. And we'll be back in just a few minutes. Okay, we are back, and we're spending time this evening with Michael Druxman. We're talking about his memoir, My 45 Years in Hollywood and How I Escaped Alive. Michael, in the last segment, you mentioned uh, the actor John Carradine, and I want to back up a little bit because in the beginning when I asked you when you decided you wanted to get into the uh, into the uh, Hollywood biz, the movie biz, you mentioned when you were a, a little kid. And along the way, as a kid, you developed an affection for collecting autographs, and you had a very funny story about getting an autograph from John Carradine. No, I think you mean uh, you know Raymond Massey. I think you're referring to, I, 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 because Carradine, I, uh, you know, I just got his autograph. He was at the Cirque Playhouse in Seattle, and I got his autograph. I think this, I think uh, you know they people get them con- con- confused. Massey, I think, is the uh, you know, I used to, the, the Olympic Hotel was the um, number one uh, hotel in Seattle back then. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, any, any movie stars that came to town usually stayed there. And I always watched the papers to see was in te- who was in town. And Raymond Massey came to town for some, I think, I think Eisenhower was running for his second term and Raymond Massey was co- coming into town to give a political speech. And so I went to the Olympic Hotel. And uh, back then you go to the desk and say, what what room is Raymond Massey in? And they told you. <laughs> And um, so I went up, knocked on his door, and he came to the door, and he he bawled me out for bothering him, but he gave me his autograph, <laughs> probably just to get rid of me. I probably was maybe 12, 13, 14 years old, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I did that all the time. I mean, I, I remember going, Eddie Fisher was another one that was at the Olympic, and Rocky Marciano, and uh, I, I, w- I would do that all the time. I would... No star. Hello. I'm still here, Michael. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah, <laughs> no we, we lost there. you for a moment there. I think we we got a. I've got a call waiting coming in on my other line. Which. Oops. Well, we're um, still here. Yeah. So I'm, I'm hearing a beep, and that might be interrupting us. So was it Raymond Massey that you described as being a, a really scary character or, or something like that? Yeah, I think I think that's who it is. That's 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 the only one who um you know, gave me any pro- gave me any problems. Everybody oh, okay. else was very gracious, but he was <laughs> But you know, John Carradine, I remember he described him once cuz I got to know Carradine over the years. We did several things, you know, things together. Um uh, but he was at once described uh, Raymond Massey as the most humorless man he'd ever met. That's what it was I that I read. Right. I just thought that was yeah. very amusing. Because actually, I thought both of them were actually kind of scary. <laughs> well, Car- that, Carradine was a very Carradine. nice man. I, he was very good to me. He, uh, you know, I would interview him several times. I interviewed him for my Basil Rathbone book. I went up to – he was living in a – had a condo in uh, – I think it was Oxford. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, uh, not Oxford. Um, my guy I used to live there. I can't think of it. Was, you know, I'm 72 years old now. My memory's going, but he, you're not yeah, up by Santa Barbara, and um, so, so I went up there and he, uh, you know, interviewed him on my Basil Rathbone book, and I interviewed him when I was doing my column for Coronet, and you know, we would just encounter each other over the years, over many years, mm-hmm. and uh, it was very interesting. Very interesting. I, I always told you there was a there was a sadness about him. Uh, yeah, maybe that's why he was so good at playing those scary characters. Oh yeah. Well, of course, his greatest role was the Grapes of Wrath. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, I think that's his finest. He should have been. He should have gotten an Oscar nomination for that. Right. Hmm. So you spent quite a few years as a publicist, and and during that time, you got to. Uh, uh, to meet just just about everybody, and uh, your your book is just uh, peppered with all these interesting little uh, brief encounters here and there with people. Would you like to share some of them uh, with us? Uh, well, throw a uh, name at me. You know, I mean, it, it's so many. Oh, wh- whoever comes to mind for you that uh, you know were, were some of your favorites or or more. Well, you know, I, I represented people like uh, Abe Bogota and and. Uh, uh, I'll tell you the the the, the uh, uh, of all the people I rep- ever represented, I think the ones that I am most proud of having known and worked with uh, were a couple of very famous songwriters by the name of uh, Paul Francis Webster and Sammy Fain, and uh, they together wrote "Love Is a Many Splendored Thing." They wrote uh, "Secret Love." Uh, Webster, uh, with other people, wrote things like "The Green Leaves of Summer," "The Shadow of Your Smile." Mm-hmm. Uh, Sammy Fain wrote uh, with others, "I'll be seeing you." I mean, they were t- t- to me the two of the greatest song uh, writers who ever lived, and um, I represented them for many, many years, primarily Webster. And there was a time when uh, Paul Francis Webster, I think, was nominated for thirteen or fourteen times for an Oscar. He loved the idea of run of campaigning for an Oscar, and one time he calls me. He says, I got a, I've got a song and a picture I want to run for an Oscar, do an Oscar campaign. Well, this is a song from a picture that nobody, thank God, had ever seen. It had played one week in Beverly Hills to qualify. 
uh, uh, and this, there was no commercial recording of the song. The only recording we had was Sammy Fain doing a demo. So we sent, so we sent the, the we sent the uh, the demo out to everybody in the music branch, and then I then I came up with this idea of doing a, um, a dial a song, and I I, I got. Two answering machines, put them in the closet in my office, and we've started running ads. Dial this number. Here's Sammy Fain singing his 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 Oscar contender song. That phone didn't stop ringing. Those phones didn't stop ringing for th- for three weeks. It was driving me crazy in my office. <laughs> we got nominated for an Oscar, <laughs> and it worked. Uh, we were nominated. Yes. Uh, and unfortunately, that was the year that Barbara Streisand came up with uh, had um, uh, Evergreen. But we we were in the five songs. Eddie Albert sang the song on um, the Oscar cast, and uh, you know the the, the, the uh, in several of the um, history books of Oscars, they mention that they don't mention my name, but they mention that campaign. I'm sort of proud of that. Mm-hmm. Neat. Very, very neat. Yeah, uh, we're we're coming up on our break in about a minute, but uh, let's uh, we got time. Let's let's get into how did you start uh, writing and directing films for uh, the King of the Bee movies, Roger Corman? Um, well, I had sold him a couple of scripts. He'd bought a couple of my scripts, uh, Cheyenne Warrior, and a film uh, uh, that became Dillinger, and a script that became Dillinger and Capone, and. Then they were looking for, um, you know, they got, I got a call from one day, uh, from his story editor one day, and they said, we want you to write a script for us. Because where, as a writer in Hollywood, where you make your money, your living, it's not for selling, from selling an individual script, it's from assignment. Because most producers have an idea, I want to do a movie about X, and then they hire a writer. And... Uh, so they just kept hiring me and doing one film after and writing one film after another. And finally, so I'd really like to direct one. And Michael, so, uh, let's pick that up on the other side because we have to do a commercial break. And uh, you can continue your, your story about your time with Roger Corman. Be right back, okay. folks. Okay, we are back, and we're rolling into our last segment on a Friday night here on Far Out Radio. We're spending time with Michael Druxman. We're talking about his memoir, My 45 Years in Hollywood, and How I Escaped a Lot, published by the very nice folks at Bear Manor Media. Books available at Amazon.com in print and in Kindle format. And Michael's got a lot of other books to his credit, and uh, as well as a large collection of celebrity-based plays also available at Amazon. So, okay, uh, Michael, uh, we were talking about Roger Corman. Right. Um, well, you know, I, I uh, he gave me the opportunity to direct one of my scripts. Uh, it was called The Doorway. We shot it in Ireland. It, we have Roy Scheider was in it, and um, it was quite an experience. Uh, we shot it in um, in uh, November November of ninety nine. It was a lot of rain, a lot of cold, a lot of wind. We were right on the Irish, on the Atlantic coast. I mean, we were like half a block from the coast. Mm-hmm. And um, the first three weeks I was there doing pre-production, um, I was in in this manor house, which Roger had built to house cast members and people he had brought over from the United States. And the manor house, it was the haunted house movie we were doing, and the exterior and part of the interior of the ma- manor house is what we used as the haunted house in the movie. So you can get an idea. Of, <laughs> I, I'm in there for three weeks by myself, and the the the, the wind is blasting, and it sounds like the like the roof is going to come off, and there's mm-hmm. funny sounds and all that sort of stuff. But it was quite an experience. Uh, I was trying to remember, and I was getting ready for the program this evening, but sometime in the last year, I I saw a movie, and I don't remember if it was on Netflix or if it was on YouTube or wherever, but it was a retrospective of Roger Corman's movies, and what was so much fun about it was that they had a lot of interviews and uh, a sequence of uh, uh, actors who were just starting out in their career, 
uh, who made it big, um, uh, Ron Howard and uh, Jack Nicholson. And uh, there was one well, – I forget what the name of the film was with Jack Nicholson. Uh, it was, uh, I think, a vampire movie or something. It was supposed to be Count Little something. Shop of Horrors or, or, or The Terror? The Terror, uh, right. It was supposed to be with, in Transylvania. Uh, it was spo- uh, I think it was supposed was to be done, in Transylvania, uh, but – No, no. It was – it's interesting because he had, he had a, deal, a, a contract with Karloff and he had like – Karloff owed him two days. In two days, and so they wrote a they wrote a, a script uh, for Karloff, and the, so they could shoot Karloff scenes for in in uh, two days or something like that, and then the, and then uh, they came back later and they shot the rest of the movie. What I thought was so interesting or amusing about it was that I believe it was supposed to take place in Transylvania, but if you look closely. Sure looks like sure looks like the beach at the uh, on California. <laughs> oh, absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, Ron Howard's "Eat My Dust," I think, was his Roger Corman uh, uh, movie, and uh, uh, I saw that, and I was always I always wondered how did he get to do another movie because that was pretty bad. But well, as Roger get said to, my... to him. Um, if you do good on this movie, you'll never have to work for me again. So evidently, <laughs> he did. the movie made money. That's, yep. that, that's, that's the thing. The movie made money. Scorsese, be, you know, uh, worked for uh, Roger. Um, uh, Coppola worked for Roger. Mm-hmm. Um, Peter Bogdanovich, first movie, I believe, was for Roger. Weren't those? Wasn't that during the time when you know Christmas is all pre-videotape? Uh, that uh, uh, those kinds of movies usually went straight to the drive-in theater. Absolutely, that was his market. Right. That, that was that was his market, uh, and um, uh, he, you know, the the thing that you know that sort of killed Roger to a certain extent was the big studios that wouldn't touch back in those days the big studios wouldn't touch sci sci fi or horror or 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 those kind of movies. And then they discovered there was money there and then they started making these movies that Roger was making for nothing. Mm-hmm. And and you know, they would be spending millions and millions of dollars and it was like Walmart coming into a um uh an area and and killing the mom mom papa stores, you know, because, because you know they do a horror film and and spend a uh, hundred million dollars on it, and Roger would uh, would have made made it for for a couple three hundred thousand dollars mm-hmm. or less. Hmm. So. Well, they seem to have embraced it now. That's for sure. That's you've written a you've written an, an interesting collection of uh, of plays uh, based on uh, famous actors. And we've got about four minutes left or so. Uh, tell us about some of those because that's yes, it's called the Hollywood Legends, and mm-hmm. uh, there's there's ten plays. Um, they're in, they're they're in an anthology, or they, they, you can get them individually. But the, nine of them are one person plays. Uh, they, they, you know, many of them have been done around the country. Uh, about two months ago, I was up in Fort Wayne, Indiana. They did a production of my uh, Carol Lombard play, and mm-hmm. that's her hometown, so they flew me in. But there's Clark Gable, there's Spencer Tracy, there's Daryl Flynn, there's Orson Welles, uh, Marie Chevalier, Al Jolson has been done around the country, um, uh, Clara Bow. Uh, the two person, the one two person play is Jeanette McDonald and Nelson Eddy. But uh, they're all available on Amazon, and um, yeah, yeah, the Orson Welles one is, has been done on audio, and we're currently putting the Clara Bow one on audio. I'm working with an actress. Very and, nice. Uh, and when these, when so who who uh, typically puts on these kinds of plays? Uh, theaters. I, you know, the Jolson thing was, uh, is, uh, you know, uh, there was a tour of Florida of it, and. Uh, it's been done in. It was last done in North Carolina about a year ago. Mm-hmm. Spencer Tracy play was done. I think it was North Carolina a couple of years ago. Um, the thing is, you you know, an actor finds that hey, this is a great vehicle for me, and uh, they go to a, a theater and they put, they put it on. You know, mm-hmm. 
it, and um, uh, you know, it's difficult to you know I, I, a one person play is scary. Yeah, it's very scary to do because there's no you know there's you're out there all by yourself. So yeah. you have to find an act, actor or an actress who wants a vehicle. And, I, many years ago, I saw Leonard Nimoy at the uh, in Philadelphia do his one one man play on uh, Vincent Van Gogh, and mm-hmm. uh, uh, all I could say was, "Wow!" You know, and you're now, right. What happens out if there. you go blank? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I was, you know, I've I've sat in the audience watching these sometimes on nights when people do go blank, and you there's nothing you can do. You're sitting there and you're thinking, "Oh my God!" You know what? You know. You want to throw them a line, and <laughs> it's. Uh, but you know, I, I, when when it ha- when it comes off, it's great. You know, mm-hmm. their uh, you know audiences uh, because our audiences know these people. They're all icons. Another one's Basil Rathbone. I did, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, people go to see their their favorite icons, and uh, the when. Wherever they're done, they're, they, they, the house is always filled. That's such a neat niche. What, what inspired you to, to pursue that? Well, this is before I had sold any screenplays. And, uh-huh. uh, you know, I, I, I like new challenges. I, I, you know, as I say, I'm a been there, done that type of person, you know. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, Hal Holbrook had done Mark Twain, and, mm-hmm. and uh, Jimmy Whitmore had done uh, Will Rogers and Harry Truman. And I thought, my God, the uh, the idea of a one person play is an interesting uh, idea. I wanted to try it, but nobody had done a move, a famous movie star. So mm-hmm. the first one I did was Clark Gable, and a local theater staged it. And you know, it, it's the most it, it was the most successful play that theater had ever done. Wow. And uh, uh, and then I did tra- the next one was Spencer Tracy and and both those plays started in the same small theater and then they moved to larger theaters mm-hmm. and uh, then Jack Carter the comedian uh, said I want you to write a play for me on on Al Jolson and so I wrote the first draft Jack and I had a falling out but I went on and did the play, and that's probably the most successful one I've had, you know, because it's been done around the country. And mm-hmm. uh, 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 Marie Chevalier, um, I, uh, the Wells one, I love the Wells one. <laughs> that uh, is maybe, very cool. I mean, that's, uh, you know, a bringing, bringing uh, you know, the classics of the earlier days of, uh, of Hollywood and filmmaking and entertainment to, uh, to a new audience and you know, those are all great people. Yes, yes. The, uh, the, the people so, so now that you're in Texas, uh, uh, what have you been doing? Well, I, I keep writing. I, uh, I'm, I, I talk to groups. I'm teaching a class here, a uh, writing class, in about three weeks. I'm, uh, then I will be at the uh, doing roundtables and probably a panel at the Austin Film Festival in October and. Uh, um, in November, I'm doing the uh, Wizard World uh, Comic Con. I, I, I do these uh, comic and horror thons because of my Roger Corman connection. Mm-hmm. You know that that you know that that gets you know people come up to me and, and have me sign stuff where they buy my books or whatever. And uh, going That's into nice. Los Angeles uh, just before Christmas for a couple book signings on my new memoir, the. Uh, Life, Liberty, and the Pursuit of Hollywood. Very good. Well, when you get that one out, I'd love to have you back on again to uh, talk about that one. Super. Michael, thank you very, very much. Have a great weekend, and um, uh, we'll uh, we'll talk soon. Thank you very much. Enjoy. You're quite welcome. Take care. That's our program for tonight. And uh, just on our way out, I want to let you know that you can uh, purchase uh, Michael Druxman's book, My 45 Years in Hollywood, How I Escaped Alive, on Amazon.com in print and in Kindle format. And if you like what you're hearing here on Far Out Radio, you can go to FarOutRadio.com, sign up for our free daily updates. That way you'll know who is going to be on the program. Have a great weekend. Take care. Be well. We'll be back next week with more Far Out Radio.